Hello and welcome back to UMETSAT for the second of our weekly roundup videos. We're coming to you today from the mission control environment. This is where we continuously monitor the health of the spacecraft and the instruments on board and make sure that all of the data is flowing out to the people who need it. Behind me, you see the Copernicus Sentinel-3 mission control room. There's always somebody there monitoring the satellite, the instruments, and the data flow. It's a 24-7 operation. Let's turn now to some of the questions that you've been asking during week two of the discussion forum. So this is a question from Morocco who was asking, is it possible to have tropical cyclones in the Mediterranean? He noticed a storm that formed there last week. The answer is um, no. These storms are actually uh, different to tropical cyclones. So the tropical cyclone really depends on having this warm water surface in order to form and be sustained. The Medicanes, these Mediterranean storms, don't require that. They get all of their energy from the atmosphere itself. The sea surface temperature um, energy can help, but it's mainly an atmospheric phenomena. If you want to know more about this, you can have a look at the Wikipedia art article, which is really quite good. And also there are some nice case studies on the UMETSAT website. Side. So this was a question from John and many of you were asking similar questions. How can we see the sea surface temperature through the clouds and where there's rain? And the answer is for the infrared we can't. There are gaps. Where there's clouds we can't see the sea surface temperature so we don't get the data then. We've been working with Japan to get some of the data from one of their satellites and that's really wonderful because we're starting to see sea surface temperature measurements underneath the clouds using a microwave instrument. And that's really important to fill in some of these gaps. The one gap that remains is where there's rain. So in this case, we have to wait until the rain's moved over, get the next satellite pass, and then see the sea surface temperature then. So this was a question from Balasaheb, who was asking how do countries go about sharing their satellite data? For us, this is an incredibly important part of what we do as a, an organisation. We negotiate with other satellite operators to make sure that users can have all the data they need to monitor the atmosphere and the oceans. The Japanese satellite I mentioned earlier is one example. We've used data from satellites in India, in China, in the US, so all around the world. And one of the things we're able to do is negotiate with these different parties to make sure, A, that we have permission to use the data, but then to actually get the data data flowing to all the users because the best thing you can do for monitoring the Earth's atmosphere system and the ocean system is to have data from multiple sources so that you can check the errors in the data and also really have the best possible information about the Earth's dynamic system. So this was a question from Maria Jose, who was asking why is the Earth's gravity different at the poles and at the equator? And that's because the Earth is slightly squashed. The poles are squashed in and the equator slightly sticks out, and that has an effect on the Earth's gravitational field. You don't know it walking around. If you were to be at the equator and then at the poles, you wouldn't feel the difference, but you can see it in the data. Having this high, accurate knowledge of the Earth's gravitational field is what means that we can get these really high accuracy sea surface height measurements of only a few centimetres, so we can see these tiny variations in the sea surface height, which is incredibly important. So this was a question from Dave, who was asking about storm surges, and a number of you were asking about storm surges during the week um, in the forums. So where the storm surges, you can have them all around the world, but where they become really important is where you have low-lying coastlines. So in Europe, one of the most dangerous places is between the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, where on both sides of the channel you have low-lying coastlines. One of the worst storm events happened in 1953, where there was a tremendous surge that had massive flooding in the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom, leading to quite some loss of life and uh, massively affecting agriculture and industry in the region. I've really enjoyed reading your discussions and the questions in the forum, and I hope you find this uh, video summary useful. This week we're going to be going on, we're going to look at the full dynamics of the ocean and how we use the observations to understand the three-dimensional ocean. We're going to look at ice monitoring, oil spill monitoring, and finish off the week looking at uh, the quality of water. So getting into things like harmful algal blooms. I'm really hoping you're finding uh, this course interesting and I hope you really enjoy this week. And I look forward to seeing you next week for our third summary video.